All right, let's keep moving on with our show. Ladies and gentlemen, get through the pre-show so we can get to the meat of the matter. And ladies and gentlemen, right now we're going to take a moment. We're going to take a moment to look skyward and look into our future technology. We're going to look to the future of possibility. And we're going to look into the heavens where there's a bunch of scattered dust, some ice, and really nothing much else, actually. And the guy who knows most about that, that what's out there, is the waste of space category, ladies and gentlemen, it's Pete Goldie, our resident astrologer. Yeah. Fine. David, look at that beautiful picture. It's another one. Now this is a composite image created from visual x-ray and infrared, again from the Spitzer. Space Telescope, which is the infrared one there. And you guys might see a lot of Spitzer images from me from now and to a little bit from now because it has a limited lifespan. It's an infrared telescope. It's full of liquid helium that is slowly bubbling and boiling off into the deep reaches of space. Eventually it'll run out of helium and then it won't be so much of an infrared scope. It'll just be a scope with infrared detectors that aren't cold enough but it'll still take some sort of pictures. They won't be this good. Anyway, what you're looking at is the famous um, remnant of uh, the nebula that was first seen in 1572 by Tycho Brahe, the famous astronomer. And the interesting thing about this is now you're seeing it in multiple composite pictures. When that supernova blew up and finally the light reached Earth, you could see it in the daytime. Was that bright? Uh, but now they're seeing something different from it. The next image you'll see here, and what happens is in 1572, Tycho Brahe and some other astronomers saw the light coming directly from the supernova to Earth. However, the light radiated in all directions is now bouncing off of dust clouds in the far, far distance and coming back, and we're seeing the light echoes of it now, and this is giving us additional information from a different angle. How the fuck do you know that there's a dust cloud out there? It says so in the chart. Right. <laughs> right, dust cloud. Right? Yeah, it's spelled out pretty clearly, I think. That, you know, even from this angle, I can see it. It's your problem. <laughs> Dave, can you show us something fun? Yeah. Because this isn't fun. Can't remember, you're supposed to play the It's Gonna Be Alright and Work Out music. But it's not. <laughs> San Francisco. The slow down sad version. Now that was uncomfortable. <laughs> now ladies and gentlemen, the reason why we gather here once a week is to bathe in the genius of one... <laughs> Harry S. Robbins. And here he is, right now, it's Dr. Howe. <laughs> Gaily bedight, a gallant knight, in sunshine and in shadow, had ridden long, singing a song in search of El Dorado. But he grew old, this knight so bold, and o'er his heart a shadow fell, as he found no spot of ground that looked like El Dorado. And as his strength failed him at length, he met a pilgrim shadow. Shadow, said he, where can it be, this land of El Dorado? Over the mountains of the moon, down the valley of the shadow, ride, boldly ride, the shade replied, if you would seek El Dorado. Ladies and gentlemen, your footsteps and brought you here to the Ask Dr. Hal Show on this particular night. We are happy and delighted to host you. Our show is an evolving event with many features which come to light, like strange and wonderful artifacts dug up out of muddy fields. One never suspected that they were there until they popped up into human ken. And that is the way our show is, because uh, out of the dirt 
the mud and the slime, the filth of the mire. Occasionally we do produce a few gems. Although, usually what we get is more filth of the mire. Uh, I'm uh, also very happy to be with my talented co-performers, Chicken John, K-Rock, and David Kapoor. And in our yeah, beloved yeah. ancient monuments are destroyed, and time itself has no meaning in the panic of total world obliteration. Yes, not only the uh, beloved signs of humans' mastery will be eradicated and now made to serve the imago of new alien masters, but the aliens themselves will be present and demand that we bow down to them in subservience, even as on vacation they snap their shots while we lose our priceless treasures. How sad it will be. Even things which have seemed a part of our world will be swept away, knocked down, and these fiendish beasts will rejoice. The more humans are discomforted, the happier they will be. Why should alien beings be free from the vices of sadism and cruelty? Can they not be as decadent as we in that regard? They might just want to change the channel on our previous... Uh... Are we winning a war on Christmas? I think we are. I think that we are experiencing subtle signs of what to call, for want of a better term, battle fatigue. Every year we try to pull our weapons together and with the throbbing of old wounds felt deeply in our bones and in our souls, we gather again under the banner of consumerism and march out to serve is it Santa or Satan? The words are the same. And this red-colored, red-suited god of greed does seem to epitomize many satanic characteristics and traits. Gluttony, sloth, greed, cupidity, and all desires for everything unclean and envious. Everything opposed to the spirit of charity for which the Christian holiday is ostensibly made to showcase. So I leave it up to you. Yes, people are tired. A lot of people already, uh, they already go out of Christmas. They no longer uh, participate in it. They consider it a good Christmas present to be left alone, to be left out of it, not have to participate in the potlatch of buying more and more useless objects and piling them high in a huge heap which can only fall upon us to crush us for our doom as those who have succumbed to the lure of materialism. But on the other hand, the kids like it, you know, you can't fight City Hall, and uh, I think uh, we've covered that one. Who is your least favorite poet? And could you produce a sample of his or her verse? There is one poet whose uh, work can never be pleasing, and that is, of course, Julia Moore, the so-called sweet singer of Michigan, the worst poet in American history. She was terrible, just awful. She used to write poems, usually when some child had died, something like that. Uh, in fact, it was said that uh, no sooner had an infant perished than Julia was there with the eulogy before the little body had even grown cold. And she wrote about uh, the uh, catastrophes of her day, mostly when steam locomotives and passenger trains went off bridges and, and like that. You're, you'll not like this one because it's so pointless, uh, tedious, and bad. Um, uh, it was written uh, in, in 1876, and uh, it goes like this. Uh, <clears throat> in the year 1876, a 4th of July celebration was held in Grand Rapids City in honor of our great nation. The largest city in the county of Kent is Grand Rapids, and it is respected. For millions of people was here to see the beautiful arch, 
erected. Oh. The paintings and mottos on the arch was viewed by many people. It was Colonel Joseph Penny's design, and the work it could not be equal. A cabin was built there too, I believe, which also represented one that the traders built years ago. This was the only one invented. Ten thousand people respected it, this token of early years, with joy. The honor of this little hut was due to Mr. Godfroy. All right, that's uh, that's enough.